Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Good morning, Wildwood. It's good to be back this morning after a nice week away from uh, the normal life. My family and I got to the Upper Peninsula as well as uh, Wisconsin over the last nine days and had a wonderful time. My wife planned a beautiful vacation for us uh, as well as a pastoral retreat, which is always uh, good. It's always refreshing to go and to know that no matter what, what kind of ministry you're doing, ministry is difficult. And, and that was my big takeaway because I was uh, speaking with some energized church planters, some guys that were really demoralized trying to do revitalization, uh, some guys that have been there in their ministry for 15 years and are just now seeing fruit <clears throat> and, and, and all, all across the board. And so it was really a wonderful time. I was able to speak into the lives of some of these young men. It's, it, it is, it is a, an interesting thing now. I still view myself as a young man, but I was the oldest at this pastor retreat. <laughs> and listen, that's okay. If, if you're older than me, I want you to rejoice in your what ought to be wisdom and maturity in the faith. That, that's what I felt. I felt like, okay, um, I'm not an, a new inexperienced pastor anymore. Uh, I have some experience that I can share with these young men who are doing hard work. And that was a wonderful thing for me. And, and as you grow in the faith, that, that ought to be how you think. That ought to be how you uh, I- interpret and process, you know, the gray hairs. You can either uh, bemoan them or you can embrace them. Now, or you can dye them for a little while, I'm sure. <laughs> but with that, with those gray hairs ought to be coming wisdom. And if there's wisdom, there ought to be investment in the lives of other people. And I look forward, there, there's a, a, a pastor that's been doing this now for a long time. He's in his 70s, and he's now the guy that leads these pastor retreats. And I looked around this room, and uh, I'm just a little bit older than some of them. And I long for that day when I'm decades older than these pastors with decades of ministry experience and marriage experience and parenting experience to be able to invest in the lives of younger people. And so the Lord helped me to see that. Uh, and, and like I said, he helped me to see that ministry is difficult no matter where, no matter what. Uh, ministry is difficult. But, you know, I, I reflect on Wildwood over the last couple of weeks, and I, I give the Lord praise. Because two weeks ago, we commissioned a team to Galveston, and they went down, and they did the Lord's work there in 115-degree weather. And last weekend, while I was not here, uh, this congregation commissioned uh, 30 or so missionaries to Haiti on two different trips. And one team is down there now doing the Lord's work, and another team is leaving soon to do the Lord's work. And today we're going to have the opportunity to invite Alex to the stage after second service, and we're going to ask him some questions. And then we're going to vote to call him as an elder and send him as an elder qualified man to his church in Japan. And next week, we're gonna commission him and say goodbye to him and his family. Man, one week after after another, the Lord is showing us what we ought to be about. Reaching the nations, reaching the lost, taking the gospel across the street and around the world, Amen? amen? And I'm proud to be your pastor. And I'm proud to be back. I'm ready to get back into Romans chapter 7. So open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. Uh, In this passage, we're going to see an internal struggle vocalized. For everyone who hates their sin and comes to a place of desperation, crying out, God, how long will you allow me to, to struggle with this sin? This passage is a breath of fresh air. Now, I want to note that this passage is widely debated. There's two interpretations. One interpretation is that in this passage, Paul is speaking metaphorically on behalf of religious Jews, unregenerate, not born again, but simply religious Jews, striving to obey the law without the aid of the Holy Spirit. The other interpretation is that he is portraying his personal, ongoing struggle within. 
And therefore, the struggle of a born-again believer who fights the war within them. The latter interpretation is where I land. However, I appreciate the arguments of the former. I've studied both, and I can appreciate the idea that this is not the experience of a born-again believer, that this is what Paul is saying was his life as a religious, devout Jew. I can appreciate this. There's some, there's some very poignant uh, points to that argument. But where I land is that Paul is describing, and, and I'll explain as I get through the sermon, but I land that this is Paul's present tense wrestle in his heart, in his conscience, in his convictions, that he hates his sin and he's, and he's wrestling with it, he's fighting against it. What I don't see here in, in Romans 7 is the wrestle of a self-righteous Jew. I, I don't see Paul describing a legalist, but a man who loves the Lord with all of his heart and is keenly aware of how frequently he falls short of perfection. What I think we can all agree on is our life is a walking contradiction to use Daniel Doriani's turn of phrase. One moment, we're singing and praising the Lord, we're filled with eager anticipation and hope and commitment to live our lives to the glory of God. We, usually that's Sunday morning, right? And then by Sunday afternoon or Monday morning or Wednesday at noon, we're melting on the floor over something that didn't quite go our way. And we play the role of victim rather than victor. One moment we're confessing our sins and we're diving headlong into the disciplines of the faith like Bible study and Christian fellowship and praying and fasting and giving and all the things. And the next, we're convincing ourselves that skipping church and pulling back from our groups and getting spiritually lazy is okay. After all, we don't want to be legalistic. One moment we're standing boldly for the Lord and the next moment we're giving in to sin. We're walking contradictions. That's real life. No matter who you are, that's real life. And it's really demoralizing. I know from experience, and I'm sure you know from experience, it can be demoralizing, these ups and downs. And so I praise the Lord for Paul's vulnerability. That's what I see. When I read Romans 7, I see Paul's vulnerability. And you know, knowing that you are not alone in this wrestle, this struggle, the war within, I hope can be an encouragement to you. I hope that it can remind you to stay in the fight and to lean on the Holy Spirit. In this current section, what we're in, we're in sanctification, Romans 6, 1 through 8, 39. This whole section is this idea of sanctification. And in this section, Paul describes the complex nature of living in the already, not yet. Maybe you've heard that phrase before, the already, not yet. The Lord has already come and has already established his kingdom, but we await his second coming and the full consummation the already and the not yet. And similar, we're already believers and we're already filled with the Holy Spirit and we're already released from the power of sin and yet we still feel the pull of sin in our lives. We have the Holy Spirit in us and yet we must be told to walk by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit. Already, not yet. There's a tension. That's what I see in Romans 7, attention. In fact, that's what I see in Romans 6, 7, and 8. One of the, one of the uh, shortcomings or one of, one of the, the weaknesses of preaching expositionally, verse by verse, through a letter like this, is that we are now on week 41, and it would have taken the Romans about 20 minutes to have read through this at this point. You see? 
And so if, if you're confused, I would encourage you maybe throughout these two or three years or so to go and read all of Romans to get the full flavor of it. Maybe the Lord will, 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 will say that I ought to do that in one of these sermons. Just read through the whole letter. But Romans 6, 7, and 8 are not, are not sequential. The, Paul, Paul is telling us the experience, the, the, the life in the tension called sanctification. We have been released from slavery to sin, and yet we still feel the pull. And Romans 8 is going to tell us that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and reminding us to walk by the Spirit, to remember that you are not enslaved to sin any longer, to get in the fight, to engage in the wrestle. Let's read here Romans 7, 13 through 20. Paul said, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure so that we know that the law is, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Let's pray. Father, you know that this passage has been debated for millennia, that it has been hotly debated, Lord, that there is uncertainty, even in my mind, even as I preach, but Holy Spirit, we know that you can bring clarity, and you can give wisdom, and you can enlighten us, and you can help us to understand your intent. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Lord, help me to be faithful as I preach. Help us to be faithful as we listen. And that we would not just hear, but we would do. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul says in verse 13, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. So he, he says, if the law is holy and righteous and good, verse 12, Pastor Andrew talked about that last week, if it's holy and righteous and good, how could it bring death to me? It could not. It is God's perfect will. It is given to us by God himself. So what do we say then? How do we justify what Paul said in verse five? Our sinful passions were aroused by the law to bear fruit for death. How can we, how can we justify, reconcile these two statements that the law is good and yet the law bears fruit for death, that, that through the law our sin is aroused to bear fruit for death? How can we reconcile these two things? Here's the answer. Paul continues, it was sin, not the law. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, the law. In order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Paul said in, in Romans 3.20 that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law magnifies our sin. The law doesn't make our sin. The law magnifies, puts a magnifying glass on our sin so that it can be put in bold relief, so that it can be highlighted, it can be very clear what sin is. It provides all the opportunities that we need to indulge all the sinful passions and for all of our sinful passions to express themselves fully and completely, look, so that in order that sin might be what? It's right there in your, in your text, verse 13, so that sin might be shown to be sin. So that the, that the thing that you justify, the thing that you ignore, the thing that you say, ah, it's not really a big deal, is shown to be sin. The law shows you that the thing that you're just sort of playing with 
toying with is sin, and sin brings death. Thank you, Lord, for the law, so that now we know. Verse 14 and 15. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Paul goes back to first person pronouns, and he uses it in the present tense. And hermeneutics 101, or the study, the interpretation of the Bible, the, the most basic premise of the text is that you allow, you read the, the text the simplest way possible. The simplest way to understand this text is Paul is speaking of himself in the present tense. Now again, there's some compelling arguments made by the other interpretation, the other, the other side. But the simplest way, at, at, at first glance, just reading through this casually, very quickly through the, the letter, or hearing it read in one fell swoop, for Paul to say that I am of the flesh, sold under sin, I do not understand my own actions, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate, the simplest understanding is that Paul is speaking of himself in the present tense. He is, in, in my interpretation, and in the interpretation, this is generally the interpretation of the reformers. This is an interpretation that's saying that Paul is describing his present wrestle against his flesh. We certainly feel the wrestle in our lives, don't we? I think that this is exactly what Paul is talking about in Galatians 5. He says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Now, who is, who is Paul speaking to in Galatians? Believers. Now, believers that had turned back toward legalism, but, but they were gospel-believing Christians. And he says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. That, that is the very real struggle of believers everywhere. And, and listen, it's okay to acknowledge sin. It's okay to say, I have not yet achieved perfection. But by the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, I am being sanctified, I am being made like Christ. And the things that I wrestled with years ago are less of a wrestle or not a wrestle today. Praise the Lord for deliverance. Praise the Lord for healing. Praise the Lord for growth. What it's not okay to do is to say, is to justify sin. It's okay to acknowledge sin. It's not okay to justify sin. It's okay to say, you know what, I'm not perfect, but by God's grace, I am striving. What it's not okay to say is, that's just who I am. It's just my personality. I'm an angry person. I'm a vengeful person. I'm a lazy person. I'm a greedy person, a lustful person. It's just who I am. I'm forgiven in Christ, not perfect, it's just who I am. It's not okay to do that. It would be a mistake for us to read this text and to imagine that Paul is not t calling us to wrestle against sin. To just be like, well, there's a war within, so we're just gonna sit on the sidelines and wait until the Holy Spirit makes it easy for us to deal with this. It's okay to acknowledge sin, it's not okay to justify it. Paul says, I do not understand my own actions. It's okay. It's okay to be there. I don't understand. I don't like who I am. I don't like that I respond this way. I don't like that this continues to come up. I don't understand my own actions. That's an honest statement. I don't understand. Paul hated the things that he did, and Paul wanted to do the things that please God. That's the sense that I get from this passage. He hated that he, whatever it was for Paul, whatever it was for Paul, he hated what he did. And he earnestly desired to live for God. 
These sentiments that Paul expresses in Romans 7 are not sentiments expressed by unregenerate people. So this is one of the main reasons that I believe that Paul is talking about himself, and he's talking about born-again believers. Because I don't see unregenerate lost people speaking this way. What I see unregenerate lost people doing, there's two ways that you can err. And Paul describes one of them in Romans 1. Unregenerate lost people despise the truth, suppress the truth. They say, I don't want to hear what God's word has to say. I don't care about the law. They suppress the truth. That's one way to err. And the other is what Paul actually demonstrated in his own life as an unregenerate religious person. They imagine that they are doing better than they really are. So the unregenerate can err in two ways. Either they suppress the truth, I don't care about God's law, it doesn't matter to me, or they imagine that somehow they are better off than they really are. Listen to how Paul describes himself in Philippians 3.6. He's describing his life as a religious Jew. As to righteousness under the law, what? Blame us. How did Paul conceive of himself as a religious Jew? Blameless. I'm doing everything the Lord wants me to do. I I I am righteous in my own sense. I am achieving, achieving, achieving. And the way that self-righteous legalists do this is they focus on the things that come easy. They focus on the things that they don't struggle with. And the things that they do struggle with, they minimize, marginalize, and ignore. And by getting really self-righteous in judging other people, they make themselves feel better. So that they can say, as to the law of righteousness, I'm blameless. Can you fathom making that statement today? As it relates to holiness before God, I am in all of my life, in my dealings with my spouse and my kids and my finances, in my personal thought life and my heart and my motives, I'm blameless before the Lord. Come on, Paul. But that was Paul's mentality as an unregenerate, zealous Jew. Two ways to err. Suppress the truth. The unregenerate suppress the truth. They don't love God's law. They suppress it. And the unregenerate don't wrestle with their sin. They imagine that they're doing a pretty good job. The evidence that one is regenerate, born again. When I use the word regenerate, that's a good term that you need to know. Regenerate is being made new. It's being born again by the Holy Spirit. The regenerate, the evidence that one is regenerate is a growing faith. And a growing faith increases one's awareness of one's sin. You want evidence that you're in the Holy that the Holy Spirit's in you, you're in Christ, that you've been born again, you've been saved for years or decades now, and the Holy Spirit is not filling you with pride because of how well you're doing, but is reminding you of how much you still have to go. And, and, and he's honing in on smaller and more nuanced sins in your life. And he's saying, yes, good, I'm glad that you gave up the addiction. Praise the Lord, we we ought to celebrate that. Praise the Lord, You, you have moved beyond this very visible, very consuming sin. But what about the pride that wells up when you think about that? What about that? What about that tone in your voice as you speak to others? when things don't go your way. What about that sin? We're gonna deal with that. 
The evidence that one is growing in the faith is an increasing awareness of how far we have yet to go to be like Christ. The evidence that one is possibly not regenerate is imagining that you've arrived. You're there. The Lord only wanted to deal with that one thing in your life. And, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you conquered it. And now you're there. You're like Christ. Right? Romans 7 should be a comfort to every born again child of God. Because if anyone was committed to following Christ and honoring the Lord with his life, it was Paul. I don't think any of you would stand toe to toe with Paul and be like, I got you, bro. I've given up more than you for Christ's sake. He was more committed than any of us probably. And yet in this passage, if, my, if this interpretation, the interpretation of the reformers is right, then Paul is saying that even now, even though I'm committed to Christ, I love him, I love the law, I know it's right, I still wrestle with my sin. I, I think that, that he's dealt with something and then boom, something else comes up and reveals that there's more work to be done. I'm reminded of Charles Spurgeon who said, if any man thinks ill of you, and I think he was probably speaking to young pastors, young seminary students. He said, if any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with them. Why? Because you're far worse than they think you are. That'll humble you, right? Someone's angry at you, thinks you're a, a total scumbag. Don't be angry at them because you're probably worse than that. The reality is that deep within us is a rebellious spirit. We, we love the Lord, we love the law, but in our flesh, there is that pull toward sin. Each one of us has some kind of sin or some kind of propensity to go back to something or, or, or some thought. And, and, and I, just, I just wonder if when you think, when, when I say sin, if you're thinking alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography, fornication, things like this, right? No, I mean, pride, selfishness, self-centeredness. These are sins. And these are grievous And even though knowing that Paul wrestled it may not deliver us from those things, I think it is helpful to know that he wrestled with these things. And even if, even if we are never set free from all of our sin in this life, we can know that Jesus' grace is sufficient. You know, when Jesus said in Matthew 6, 41, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That resonates with me. How, how many times have you had to say, Lord, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I, I want to please you. I want to get over this. I don't like that I respond that way. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We feel this duality within us. And this is what Paul appeals to next. He says, the law is spiritual. In other words, it's given to us by God. The law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I feel the pull toward evil constantly. I feel the pressure in my mind and in my heart. If I personally, Pastor Brian, if I don't have a quiet time, a devotional time, with the Lord every morning, I am afraid of decisions that I might make that day. If, if I don't begin my day by submitting myself to the Lord and asking the Holy Spirit to lead me that day, 
I fear of the decisions that I might make or the responses that I might give. I am utterly dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God working in me, dwelling in me, speaking to me through the word of God, convicting me of my sin, encouraging me in Christ, comforting me in my affliction. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Paul says, I I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Now, to be fair, this is one of the main objections to this interpretation. How can Paul say that we have been set free from sin, we're no longer enslaved to sin, and now say, I'm sold under sin? And my answer is, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I think this is why... Paul is is expressing his vulnerability here. He's saying, in my flesh, I'm a broken man. My spirit is willing, my flesh is weak. I think this is why that after Paul tells his amazing conversion story in Philippians 3, you all know the Damascus Road story where, where he sees Jesus in a blinding light, scales fall off his eyes. He talks about the kind of man he was before. And then in in, uh, Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14, listen to how he speaks. After that incredible conversion, listen to what he says. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus has made me his own. So this is solid. What has happened over here justification is solid. That happened. Jesus made me his own. But I strive because I have not made perfection my own. I've not been made perfect. It didn't happen instantaneously. But I strive. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. I don't dwell on the past. I don't live as if I'm still there in sin. I don't, I don't walk around with my, hang, my, my head hanging low in a depression because, because I'm, a, I'm a sinner. No, I'm a saint because I've been made a saint by Christ. One thing I do, I focus forward, forgetting what lies behind and straining, straining toward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. Paul had a radical conversion story from from persecuting Christians to being persecuted even unto death for Christ. And yet despite his former life as an extremely devout Jew, his final assessment of himself was chief of sinners. Look at what he said to Timothy in his letter. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Listen, if Paul's concept was, listen, before I came to Christ, I struggled with sin, now I don't, then then it would be compelling for him to tell Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I was the foremost. And that would be an honest, humble statement. I was the greatest sinner to ever walk the face of this earth. And yet as he reflects on his life, as he reflects on his walk with Christ, he says, of whom I am the foremost. Now, do, you, do we think that Paul is going to the uh, brothels and, and is uh, getting drunk every weekend and gambling away the money that the church gave him to spend on ministry? Probably not. In fact, certainly not. But again, if our, if our image of what sin is, is, is there, we have a lot of sanctification ahead of us. What we see here is that there's a war within and there's a fight. And we fight from a place of victory. I can't say this enough. We fight from a place of victory. We are not fighting to get from lost in sin to justification. 
No, we've already been justified. We've already won. We've already got victory. And from victory, now we fight. Now we strive. Now we press on toward the prize. We fight from a place of victory, but we have to fight. You see? We have to fight. We have to press on. We have to run with endurance. We strain forward. It would be, it would be er an error for us to take this text and say, man, I love Romans 7 because Paul struggled in sin, and so it's okay for me to struggle in sin and for me to grow complacent with my sin. No, Romans 7 says fight, strive, press on, strain. Don't grow complacent. Don't grow apathetic. This is not an excuse to sin. This is an encouragement to fight against it. We stop thinking, well, I can't be changed. It's just who I am. Stop it. That might be who you are. And it stinks. So stop it. Stop being okay with that. Well, God loves me exactly as I am. Yes, but he loves you too much to leave you that way, right? Get in the fight. Verse 16, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. There's something that we need to unpack here. I've said before, we sin because we want to sin. That's a true statement. We sin because we want to sin. So I can say that I sin because I want to sin, but I do not want to sin. That's a true statement. It might sound contradictory. Why did I sin? Because I want to sin, but I don't want to sin. That's a true statement. You think, well, that's contradictory, but it's true. See, already not yet. The, 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 the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. My flesh, that is what causes me to want to sin. The flesh is kind of the epicenter of sin. But my spirit agrees with the law that it's good, that, it's, that, that what the law requires is right, and that sin is wrong. So in my flesh, I want to sin, but in my spirit, I don't want to sin. If I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. You can agree with the law that it's good and still find yourself breaking it. You break the law because you want to, but there's another part of you that agrees that what you've done is wrong. That says, no, why do you, just, why do you still do this? Why do you still live this way? But listen, I see only regenerate people agreeing with the law that it's good. Unregenerate people do not agree with the law that it's good. That, that's something that's conviction by the Holy Spirit. It's having a conscience. Verse 17, Paul takes us a step further. So now it is, not, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So he's saying, I'm not breaking the law, but sin that dwells within me is breaking the law. Now that seems maybe like uh, an abdication of responsibility. Like there, there it is, that, that's what I need. Well, Brian, when I sinned, it wasn't, it wasn't me, it was sin that dwells within me. So what are you looking at me for? Right? That's not what Paul's saying. He's not abdicating responsibility. We're not absolving ourselves of responsibility. There's a dual nature of believers, spirit and flesh. Spirit and flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is our source of sin. Paul can look at this. He can, he can come at this not from a place of identity. He is no longer a sinner. He's a saint but there's sin that still dwells within him in his flesh. His identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. That's who you are. You are a born again, blood-bought child of God if you're in Christ. That's who you are. And you have a flesh. 
And that flesh is constantly pulling you. And that's why in Romans 8, we're gonna, we're gonna see that if you live according to the flesh, you're gonna do the things according to the flesh. If you wake up tomorrow morning and you're not connecting with Jesus, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna live tomorrow in the flesh. And your words and your actions and your decisions are probably going to be fleshly ones. But you get up and you connect to Jesus, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me and you'll produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. If you get up and connect to Jesus like the branch to the vine, the vine to the branch, and you ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, lead me today, there's less of a chance you're gonna walk in the flesh and more a chance you're gonna walk in the spirit. It's not blame shifting, it's duality. It's recognizing that there's an old man or an old woman dwelling in you, a former you. And Satan doesn't stop the fight and your flesh doesn't stop the fight at your conversion. In fact, it intensifies. As a child of God, he agrees, Paul agrees, God's ways are right and just and good. But his sin nature, his flesh, pulls him towards evil. I just want you to think about your own life, your own experience. How often have you desired to do what was right? To do what pleases God, to, to only then be pulled back by the flesh and fall into sin. Let me give you three scenarios. You want this conversation to go well. You don't want to involve slander, gossip. You don't want to discourage someone. You're prayed up. You, you've gone in. You've asked the Lord to lead you, to give you words to say. You've determined to honor the Lord. And then the conversation rolls along and you let your lips get loose. And you go home and you reflect on the conversation and you realize, I did it again. Like, why did I say that? Why did I go there again? That was not edifying. It wasn't honoring to the Lord. Why does my flesh feel pulled to that? Here's another one. You head out on a date and you're determined that you're gonna remain pure in your thoughts and your actions. You prayed up. And in fact, you've invited some friends to hold you accountable. And the date is going great. And one thing leads to another and you cross a line that you said, I'm not going to cross that line again. Why do I keep going over the line? And the next morning you can't look at yourself in the mirror. Or here's one. You've determined that you're gonna honor the Lord with your finances as a good steward. You're gonna save, give, invest God's resources. You prayed up and, and, and you asked the Lord, Lord, with this paycheck, we're going to honor you. And then you head to the mall or the car dealership or you get online and all the shiny things, like that bass lure, sparkling in the lights, all the shiny things. And you walk away from that experience saying, why did I do that again? Why can't I be more disciplined in this area? Why do I keep going back to that thinking that in those things, in those shiny things, that I'm gonna find my happiness. You are a redeemed child of God, but there's an old nature that won't go down easily. There's a war within. This is Paul's point in verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. This is, this is Paul explaining what he means. It's not me, but sin in me. He begins with four. Here's what I mean. I realize that in myself, in my flesh, you see that? 
He says, there's nothing good in me that is in my flesh. He knows that Christ dwells within him. But there's nothing good in me that is in my flesh. In my sin nature, there's nothing good in me. The only good in me is Christ. I have nothing good to offer the Lord. I'm totally corrupted in my flesh. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability. I long to do it, but I don't have the ability to do it. So Paul desires what he he desires to do what's right. Now think about this as, again, wrestling with these two interpretations. Is Paul talking about his life before Christ or his life in Christ? Okay, if we're talking about his life before Christ, what would Paul say? Paul would say, I have the desire to do what is right. He would say that as a Jew. I have the desire to do what's right. A legalist would say, I have a desire to live a life honoring the Lord. And what else would he say? And I have the ability. I'm blameless. I have the desire to do what's right. And if you would just be like me, you could do what's right, says the legalist. You've met people like this, right? I pull myself up by my bootstraps. I made myself better. So can you. That's the legalist mind. Paul says here, I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability. That is an incredibly humble statement that a legalist cannot make. A Pharisee would never say, I'm unable to obey the law. Instead, a Pharisee says, blameless. Are you following me? This is why why I land here. Okay, I understand the other side. At least I'm trying to. But I see here an honest, humble heart before the Lord. And that is evidence of being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, not being legalistic and not being a Pharisee. Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I keep failing in this fight, he's saying. I keep failing. Verse 20, now if I do do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He's, He's reiterating what he's already said. In the words of Kent Hughes, Paul recognizes he is a man with two natures. One delights in the law of God, the other wages war against God's law. And thus it is with you and I. We live in the tension of the already and not yet. We feel the war raging within us. We hate our sin. We want to be rid of it completely. We're asking the Lord, how long will you allow me to continue to struggle this way? Why won't you just take it from me? How many of you have said that to the Lord? Why won't you just take this from me? Maybe the Lord's answer is so that you'll rely on me. So that you won't think that you can do this without me so that you'll know that my grace is sufficient. We know that our sin destroys, we know that it brings death, we know that that it is dishonoring to the Lord, and you know one day God will take this from us. We live in that, what was that, uh, Latin, non uh, non posse picari, not possible to sin, that's heaven. We don't have a banner for glorification. At our glorification, it will not be possible to sin. Until then, we wrestle, we fight the war within. We remind ourselves that this sin, like all other sin, and all sin we ever will commit, was paid for on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remind ourselves that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Our justification is not contingent upon our works that you wrestle with your sin is an indication of your salvation. That you seek to honor the Lord and you recognize you have so much further to go is evidence that you are born again. That you're in the sanctification process being led by the Holy Spirit. Not only that, but we remind ourselves that God loves us. And nothing proves to us the love of God like the cross of Christ. Nothing demonstrates the love of God like Jesus Christ who bore our sin in his body on the cross. 
This wrestle should cause us to remember that. Imagine if you really were perfect and you never had to think again about your sin being nailed to the cross. How close do you think you would come to Jesus on a daily basis? I'm good. I'm okay. I've got this. Lord, thank you for that one-time thing or maybe that second experience of something that made me perfect and now I'm good. And, you know, that's the mind of a legalist. I'm good. And Paul's like, no, you're not. You're made righteous by Christ. You're declared righteous by Christ. And the Holy Spirit is causing you to become righteous in deed and in thought and in word. And one glorious day, all sin will be taken from you. And until that day, we wage a war within. And we are reminded every time we observe communion, every time we observe the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of Christ's death on the cross on our behalf. Our sin is so grievous to God that no matter what it is, it deserved your death and Jesus took your death instead. And we remember that. It's an opportunity for us to reflect. It's an opportunity for us to give thanks. And there's two things for you to process this morning as you examine your hearts in preparation for the Lord's Supper because Paul tells us to examine our hearts. Here's two things I want you to think about. First is what I might call spiritual apathy. Christian, are you even in the fight? That's the first, quest, uh, that's the first question. Are you even in the fight? Or have you grown complacent with your sin as if it doesn't matter to God? To disengage and to tolerate your sin because, hey, it's all been atoned for on the cross of Christ is the most entitled thing that a person can possibly do. And it possibly reflects that that person has never been saved and forgiven in the first place. The second is what I might call spiritual burden. Are you so burdened by your sin that you're driven to despair and depression and lack joy in your life? When something goes wrong in your life, do you immediately forget the gospel and think God is punishing me because I'm a sinner? I gotta earn back his favor. This might come across humble, it might come across penitent, but it's really a denial of the goodness of God and his grace. The flesh throws your sin back in your face and says, how could a holy God possibly love you? To those who resonate with the first, the spiritual apathy, I want you to be convicted by Paul's words. I want you to get in the fight. I want you to pick up your spiritual armor and get in the fight and walk by the Holy Spirit. And to those who are resonating with the second, the spiritual burden, I want you to lay down your burdens at the feet of Jesus and find grace to help you in your time of need. And since most of us bounce back and forth between the two, I want you to do both. Pick up your full spiritual armor and get in the fight and lay down the burdens that bind you. Follow Christ and walk by the Spirit. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, you would open our ears, open our hearts, help us to, to see, to know, to understand. I pray, Father, that regardless of our interpretation, that we would know the point is walk by the Spirit and we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Thank you for our salvation. If there's any who does not know Jesus, Lord, I pray that today would be a day of regeneration, that there would be people that are born again. And for everyone else, Lord, who is already regenerate, who is already in this fight, I pray that we would engage in the battle and fight the war within. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.